I'm here if you guys can hear me. I just don't yes, know. Yes, we can. can. Good, Jason. We can hear I you. I can hear you. We can hear you just fine. Thank you very much. I'm going to. All right, Annette. Are we for real live? Like we should start the meeting? I believe I'm going to have someone check. They're going to. Okay. Go. I'm going to yeah. see if Heather can go and see yeah. if we are. Okay. Yeah. I'll wait for your. It does hit go live? Uh, does said she hit go live. Okay, I'm gonna check live. and if you're not, I'll call you right back. Or unless you wanna stay on the phone real quick for a second. I, yeah, I'll just let you hang out here okay. for a second. Okay, hold on. So if we are live, everyone's hearing this conversation. Yes. <laughs> Um, I'm having someone else check right now over the city's um, website to be sure that we are live. And she'll let us know in just a few minutes. I really You're live on we the are. city's website. Thank you so much. Great. All right. Okay. All right. Well, without further ado, thank you so much for your patience, everybody. Um, you know, this is uh, par for the course for 2020, all just kind of going with the flow and figuring things out the best we can, right? right. Um, right. So thanks, Annette and Desiree, for uh, <laughs> your perseverance through this. Thank you. Um, I'll call this meeting to order. Annette, would you uh, call the roll, please? Yes, I will. Jennifer? Here. Casey? Here. Irene? Jim. Here. Larry. Here. Carrie. She is not here. Okay. Um, roll is complete. All right. Well, thank you for um, your patience here tonight as we get all this set up. Um, as you guys know, we've, we've done a Zoom version of this at least once before, I think just once before, um, but we'll make sure that the members of the public have an opportunity to uh, participate both when we consider the, um, the application that's before us tonight um, during, you know, as we typically do for a, a period of public comment, but then also the a general time for public comment if um, there's anybody here um, with us virtually um, wanting to address the Housing Commission. Um, additionally, um, some you know, suggestions for helping this to go well, if each person would, uh, each board member would be uh, willing to uh, you know, signal that you'd like to speak um, and then wait until I or Annette say, hey, go ahead, um, Jim or, or, or Larry, to make sure that we're not talking over each other. This isn't a very big group, but um, uh, I think that would be best to make sure everybody can hear what we're saying. Um, and then if you don't have a, a comment, you know, feel free to say pass if it, it doesn't actually apply to you and if we called on you and you didn't really wanna speak. Um, also, it would be helpful, uh, especially I think, and I, I totally violated this rule, um, so I'll, I'll amend that by saying this is Casey speaking, um, but for, especially for uh, Jennifer and anybody else who's listening and, and just, you know, listening by phone and, and um, isn't able to see us, if you would um, say your name before you speak. Um, that way that, you know, especially if somebody who uh, is just listening rather than can see our faces, they know who's speaking, that would be really helpful. Um, and then finally, um, our last tweak for our virtual meeting is that um, we'll make sure that all the votes that we take are roll call, um, which I think we typically do anyway, but um, that's what we're going to do to make sure that everybody understands, everybody um, knows who voted what way, if, uh, especially if there's a, a split vote, um, which I doubt will happen, but I guess it's possible. So um, any questions about those sort of ground rules, housekeeping items before we um, uh, go on to the consideration of our previous meetings minutes? Okay. Um, and one last note is I'll try to take about five to 10 seconds 
um, of time uh, to wait for your responses. Cause I especially, you know, if you, you think of something but then you're trying to look for that unmute button uh, it might take a little while to find that to, to be able to speak. So um, it's a little bit of an awkward pause, but I'll try to, to make that sufficiently long to make sure people have a chance to, to speak if they'd like to. So without further ado, um, I'll move on to the approval of the minutes. We have the minutes of the um, May 21st, 2020 meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. This is Jim, so moved. Hey, I think second. I've got a wave from Larry. Larry, do you want a second? Yes, sorry, I had to unmute first. Uh, yes, I second. All right, I have a, a, a motion on the floor to approve the minutes from May 21st from, from 21st from Larry and a second from Larry. I'm sorry, from first, sorry. Motion from Jim, second from Larry. Uh, all those, I guess, do we want to do a roll call vote for this, Annette? No, I don't even want, okay, good. That sounds good. All right, all those in favor say aye. You'll have to unmute to say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. I'll wait 10 seconds for the nays. Okay. I will say the uh, minutes have been approved from uh, May 21st, 2020. Uh, our next item of business is uh, an adoption of a time limit. Let me go to my cheat sheet here. Um, as you know, with, as I'm sure you probably heard, it was with uh, Zoom meetings that, um, you know, we wanna try to make these Zoom meetings as productive as possible. Um, just like our, our in-person meetings. Um, one way to do that, uh, the city attorney has uh, recommended to us that we adopt a time limit for public comment for individual public comment, um, which we haven't done uh, in our in-person meetings before. Um, so I'll, I'll ask for, uh, does everybody have this memo or do I need to make this motion, uh, Annette? I see, I see a question from Larry. Uh, Go ahead, Larry. Yeah, um, uh, we've done this before. Do we need to do this at each meeting? I am Annette, not. do you wanna to speak to that? I think, it was, I think it's in our minutes from the May meeting, but uh, I'll, I'll stand corrected if I'm wrong. Yeah. Yes, um, at our May meeting, I wasn't sure if we had done it uh, kind of proactively moving forward and with all of the changes that have been taking place um, with all of these different rules and legislation, I really did think that it would probably be prudent, even though I don't see that we have any other attendees yet to make comments, but um, we may. So I thought it would be prudent just to go ahead for this meeting and do this. Yeah, I, I agree on that. I mean, with the, the executive order orders being uh, mucked up and the new legislation around the OMA, I, I think it makes, we'll do belts and suspenders. All right, well, um, I'll just go ahead and uh, make the motion unless there's an objection. Um, I move that in order to maintain the order of an online public meeting, uh, we adopt a rule pursuant to MCL 15.263 subsection one, limiting public comment to two minutes per individual for all electronics meetings held by the Housing Commission. Any, uh, do I have a second? And then we can do discussion. I second, just as Jim. <laughs> All right, I hear a second from James. Uh, any discussion, questions, comments about this before we do a vote? All right, I waited our weird 10 second pause. Uh, seeing none, uh, Annette, would you call the roll? Yes, I will. Jennifer? What am I saying? Uh, uh, I agree. I mean, what am I saying? Yeah. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 We have all ayes. All right. Uh, so motion passes uh, to limit public comment to two minutes per individual. Thank you, folks.
Let's go on to our next agenda item. If I can find my agenda, that would be helpful. There it is. Um, commissioner concerns. Any commissioner concerns uh, about things that are not on our agenda? All right, hearing none, I will say let's uh, consider communications from citizens. Annette, do we have any written or, um, I don't know, voicemail communications that we ought to know about? No, I do not have any written communications that are um, not already in your packet. You have two emails that we received in regards to our upcoming public hearing at fi regarding 523 Bainbridge Unit 30 but those were um, posted in the packet online. I am happy to uh, just go over them if uh, anyone wants me to quickly do that. I certainly can, I have them here handy. Would anybody like some detail on those emails before we go on to uh, Sharon Woods with Land Use USA? No. All I would right. know what they say. Oh, Jason, you know what? We can. How about we do that at the hearing? Okay, no problem. Perfect. Okay. All right. Um, so seeing that there isn't uh, anything that's of general applicability, let's go to uh, item number five. Uh, Sharon Woods, welcome. We spoke a little bit. Um, uh, you introduced yourself a little bit before. Um, tell us a little about yourself and uh, more about what you have to share with us today. Yeah, thank you commissioners for having me this evening again. My name is Sharon Woods. My offices um, with Land Use USA are based out of Langsburg, Michigan, just half an hour, less than half an hour north of you. Purely coincidence, really. Um, I am a market analyst by trade and I, my background is really in retail. So the first 10 years of my career, I spent doing retail market studies um, it, across the nation and worked for a target corporation in Minneapolis for Macy's and Cincinnati. And I came up to Michigan to try to help save Kmart back in 2000. And uh, when I failed, I went in, into consulting and uh, landed on my feet and, and fell into something that I really loved, which was doing downtown retail market studies. And about 15 years ago, I was invited by Mishta to start working on affordable housing studies. And then about, um, gosh, almost 10 years ago now, Jim Tischler also invited me to start doing target market analyses um, across the state of Michigan. And I've done about, gosh, um, it might be close to 100 target residential target market analyses across the state of Michigan um, since, I want to say since 2013. So um, I come with a lot of experience and um, both in the housing market and also in the retail industry. So again, my expertise is in market research and analysis. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see, you know, the keywords here, target market analysis, residential market study, housing study, and of course, retail studies as well. And if we jump to the next slide real quickly, I want to um, just kind of familiarize yourself with Justin Sprague because he's also a key member of my team. I will be doing the housing study for you and Justin Sprague is going to work on the housing strategic plan. And so those are those keywords at the bottom of the slide there. Justin couldn't join us this evening, but um, basically he's going to do a review of current housing policies within the city and he's going to talk with some stakeholders and basically um, go into kind of the history of the city and its policies with housing and come back with recommendations that are aligned with the results of the market study. So if we jump to the next slide, Annette is thankfully guiding us through this. Thank you, Annette. One of the documents that, um, yep, one of the documents that we want to share with you 
I'm going to pause here and just ask Annette, have they received these handouts? Um, I was hoping that they would actually have them in front of them during the meeting. You know, I did not forward them on. I should have asked you. I wasn't sure if you wanted them uh, posted uh, with our packet online or if you wanted to explain it first. So no, they do not have them. I'm sorry. To okay, say. that's okay. It would, would it be possible? I realize I might be asking a lot of you <laughs> to juggle and do this, but would it be possible to just send them um, the, the, the three attachments even while we're talking? And some of them might be able to get it by email. It would be. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I think it will really help facilitate the discussion. My fault, I should have made that, I should have. Um... So Justin and I, while Annette is working on sending you the attachments, Justin and I work together quite a bit. We're currently working together on your project. We're also working together um, in DeWitt Township, Canadian Lakes, which is out in Macosta County, Garfield Township, which is up in Clare County. We've worked together in Luna Pier. We're collaborating in um, some urban cities like Hamtramck, Inkster, um, places like that. So we do team up quite a bit and almost always I do the housing study and he looks at the policy stuff. What that does is by me having him help me, I'm able to really focus on that on the supply and demand and measuring the market potential for housing units. And then he's able to address all of the kind of policy related questions. So if, if you um, Receive the email with the attachments. One of the, the, let's see, the first attachment is going to be a copy of this presentation. So you'll have all of these slides. The second attachment is Miss, uh, Michi Michigan's Missing Middle. It's this four page article that I wrote. It's basically a summary of what we're seeing as an average trend across the state of Michigan. And I'm going to walk you through some of these slides. Um, Annette, if you're able to drive an email at the same time, <laughs> it's, yes. she's a superwoman. Um, just jump to the next slide whenever you can. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, yes, the email has been sent. So for those who awesome. also have access, it will be in your inbox. So I'm going to walk you through some of the just a few of the exhibits in the in the four page brochure. This first exhibit is and these exhibits, I'm highlighting them because they're fundamental. They're very key to the target market analysis approach. So just, just with a couple of um, exhibits here, I'm gonna kind of introduce some new vocabulary and terminology for you that is really the basis for much of the work that I do. The first thing is that when I do a housing study, I don't just look at the households that currently live in the city of East Lansing. I'm actually more interested in the households that are migrating into the city. And the reason is that your existing households are already settled. Your buyers have already bought houses. Your renters have already rented a unit and they're, they're settled at least for the year um, in general. Not all of them, of course, but most of them. I'm, and if we just study who's already in the market, we might miss, there's a possibility that we could overlook households that are migrating throughout the greater Tri-County region and maybe bypassing the city altogether. And we wanna understand who's moving into the, into the area and also who's moving within. So this is really key to understand that when we look at households that are migrating, um, most of them are going to be renters. Renters have a tendency to, to move. Um, all of the renters in your market are going to turn over at least every three years. So on the renter side of this graphic, the 10.9% that you see 
That tells me that um, this is a Michigan average, but let's pretend it were East Lansing. Then that would imply that 10.9% of your renters are brand new renters migrating into the city each year. Plus 20.3% of your current renters are shuffling within. They're packing their boxes, moving from one address to another address within the city. So collectively, if we add those together, it's at least 30%. So 30% of all renters move every year. And that, that's really the average. It's a national average and Michigan is very similar. Now, if we look at the owners, the interesting thing is um, actually back, yep. The interesting thing is that only six to 7% of home owners move in any given year. So if only 7% of the owners are moving but 30% of the renters are moving, then you get a sense of who's really churning through the market, who's really on the move and, and looking for new housing choices. And then Annette, the next slide. When I do a target market analysis, I wanna explain that a target market is a group of households that we've identified for a product or a goods or goods or services. It's a group of households that have certain lifestyle attributes and there are 71 lifestyle clusters across the nation. And when we identify certain clusters for a product like housing, for example, as think of housing as being a product, if we identify certain um, lifestyle clusters for a housing product, then they become a target market. And target markets could be I mean, I could be an automotive dealership trying to sell cars and I want to know who's my target market. Or I might be Payless Shoes, you know, trying to sell shoes out in the market and I, I want to know who my target is. In this exhibit, the, tar the urban target markets for housing in Michigan are kind of shown on this slide. The biggest one is the striving singles at the bottom of the page. And you can see that 28% of the urban target markets in Michigan are striving singles. And you're gonna ask me, I always get this question, well, who are they to tell us more about them? So it's, what's interesting is I have 20 pages of data on how the striving singles behave. I also have 20 pages of data on how the farm, family troopers behave. So the labels are kind of loosey goosey. I like to say they're, they're kind of short and um, you can kind of make a guess about who they are, but I have, I, have, I have the data at my fingertips that allows me to go in and build a model and actually build an analysis to figure out not only whether they're inclined to be renters and versus owners, but how much income they have, what their family composition is, what sort of home value or rent they would be inclined to, to pay, and then, you know, other lifestyle attributes, like one of the clusters here is colleges and cafes, which I know is going to be very interesting to you, the O53 group. They behave very differently than the type money, the S70 at the top of the page. The type money, they're, they're among the poorest of the poor, and they have different reasons for moving from one place to another. The striving singles, um, have very different reasons for moving than the tight monies or the colleges and cafes. So they're all, they're, they all have very unique attributes. And then next slide. So this um, graph is a little, there's a lot on the page, I realize that, but let me just start with the houses. On the leftmost side of the page or of the graph, demand is shown in blue and supply is shown in gray. And these are statewide averages. And it basically shows that of all households migrating in the state of Michigan right now and looking for houses, looking for housing, 65% of them would be inclined to choose a detached house. However, 85% of our current housing stock is detached houses. And then the flip side is that um, 35% of all migrating households are looking for something other than a house, but only 15% of the supply is something other than a house. So we have a mismatch. If, if you do the math, it basically suggests that 20% 20 
of all households migrating into and within Michigan today are not finding what they're looking for. They can find houses, but they can't find the attached alternatives that they might be inclined to choose. And the next slide, and I'm, I realize I'm going really fast because in the interest of time, I know your time is valuable this evening. I, I wanna leave time for questions. So this is the third handout that you will receive in the email so that you'll be able um, to pull this up and look at it and study it closely. These are the all 71 lifestyle clusters. I can't fit 71 on one page, so I split it onto two pages. And the first 36 are on the left-hand side of the slide and the, the other half are on the right-hand side. I realize, um, Annette, I'm gonna ask you to zoom in a little bit more so that we can see the left-hand page and at the top, there we go. The, if, you would see, if you're able to look at your handout or if you can see this, the very first cluster is A01, and the A doesn't matter as much here as the number one. And then at the bottom of the right-hand page, the last one is S71. As you read through the labels, you'll get a sense of their, of, of their income. So American royalty, they are the richest of the rich in the nation. Platinum prosperity, they're generally the second most affluent in the nation. Tough times and tight money at the bottom of the second page, they are the poorest of the poor. So the clusters are generally ranked by, in general, by income. Income is not the deciding factor between how households get um, put into these different buckets. There are actually um, close to 30 attributes that are used to decide how households would be put into different buckets. So you may think of um, empty nesters who want to downsize and sell their home and move into a townhouse. Well, where do they, where do they fit? It's not that simple. They could go into one group or another, and it's going to depend on how other behavior attributes might, might classify them. So some of them um, may be affluent, some might not be. Some may be family oriented and others might not be so family oriented. Some carry a lot of debt, others carry very little debt. So a big part of this is how they handle money and how they handle debt, also where they live geographically. So American royalty, they do tend to show up in big city places like um, Los Angeles and New York. I'm not surprised that, they're, that we only have eight in the city of East Lansing. But the next group, Platinum Prosperity, they show up in Michigan. Again, this is, a, this is your most affluent group in the city of East Lansing living here currently today. And you have 433 households that fit within that cluster. The next group would be Picture Perfect Family. You know, you get a sense that these are very family oriented. And then Couples with Clout, um, they often, not necessarily with children, you know, they, they're very career driven and two wage earners. Family Fantastic, I'm down at number nine. Family Fantastic, um, they love their toys, you know, so they love having big garages where they can store their boats and their snowmobiles and their motorcycles and everything. And then the, the aging population show up really across Michigan, aging of Aquarius silver sophisticates, um, and then the full pocket empty nests. So they're, they're young empty nesters, relatively young empty nesters. Status seeking singles, so they're not married and they're very career driven. They fall lower on the income spectrum often because they're, they're single wage earners. And then you've got another one down here, aging in place is 34. So you can see that the, the, the young seniors that are considering, you know, downsizing or might consider, um, you know, living in a, selling their home for a townhouse. They fall into different groups. On the next page, the group that really stands out, of course, is the colleges and cafes. It really overshadows everyone else. When I do the analysis, I'm going to split that group out and treat it give it special treatment. So I'm gonna run the analysis with them and then without them. 
and we'll we'll show you what the market potential is for just that one group as well as citywide. Striving singles right below the colleges and cafes. This is striving singles is just very very important because they have very high movership rates. They're urbanites. They tend to choose to rent attached modern housing formats like urban lofts in downtowns. So whenever I go to a metropolitan area, whether it be the greater Lansing area or Detroit or Saginaw, Kalamazoo, Grand Rapids, they show up really strong near the downtowns. They're aspiring. They seem to fall, they seem to fall fairly low on the income, but the reason is that they're early in their careers. They're very aspirational, very career driven. They're single, so they only have one, one age earner, one, one wage earner in the household, and that, that suppresses their income a little bit. But they're the up and comers. You know, they're, they're rising um, in terms of their careers, they're getting promotions, they're college educated, and they're, they're, they're the group that developers building urban lofts and downtowns are all competing for. The rest of the groups, the reaping rewards and senior towers are, are very moderate income. So they're looking for really, that's, that's really, we're now into the affordable housing bracket in that category. So the thing that stands out for me when I stand back from this big picture is that the market's affluent and it shows by the prevalence of households on the, on the upper income um, brackets and far fewer households on the lower income brackets. So I would like to, let's see, jump to the next slide. Is there another slide? Yes. So one thing that I wanted to share with you is, you know, I mentioned that I have 20 pages of data on each of these. And one of the things that I'm very interested in understanding is their inclination to choose housing by building size. And I can translate that building size into building format as well. So there's a difference between building size and format and I'll explain that. The colleges and university affiliations, you, colleges and cafes, they're the same thing, colleges and cafes. Half of this group will choose a house and the other half will look for something else. And this is something I've, you know, I've several times when Annette and I have talked, this, this topic has come up and Tom as well, this topic has come up that you can build, you can build um, attached housing formats for the colleges and cafes and just build and build and build, but there's always gonna be a percent of them that will still choose a house. We're not going to change their lifestyle preferences simply by building something else than what they're currently choosing. So I have to be really true to this data. This is nationwide averages. And I know nationwide, half of this group will choose a house, no matter how many lofts I offer them, they will, half of them will still choose a house. So that's something really important to, to think about. And if you look at this profile, you can see, well, 2% are choosing duplexes. I think it's higher than that in Lansing for sure. And I, I think what it really is, is that nine plus two. So we've got 11% are choosing duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes. And then 10% 10, 10 are in buildings with six to 12 units. And it goes up from there. And then we've got maybe seven, only 17% nationwide are actually in mid to high rises that have 50 or more units in them. So these are things that I will fold into my model to figure out you know, where, where the potential is for your market. And I wanna show you one more if we go to the next page. This is the last page and then we'll have time for questions. The striving singles, I said this was that, that group that the developers are all competing for in urban places building new lofts. And you can see it looks very different here Half of them don't choose houses. In fact, only 1% choose houses. And, and just about all of them look for something else and will be inclined to, to look for something else. So even if I offer them a house, <laughs> only 1% of them will take it. So th those, those assumptions are, are really important as you know in doing the work. 
And that's kind of my presentation. We're 25 minutes into the half hour and we have time for questions. Thank you. This is Jennifer. What's the look for something else? Like, can you kind of share a little bit more about, you know, what, what that looks like? Sure. Um, so today it, it ties to the concept of missing middle housing. And I wish I had I wish I had a diagram to show you. Um, I don't have that in front of me, but let me just describe that missing middle housing is a is a terminology that's being used nationwide and statewide. And when we if you talk to MISHTA or the MEDC or the Michigan Land Bank, they're very familiar with this concept of missing middle housing. And the concept stems from the idea that most cities and most communities offer two different types of housing. We offer houses, detached houses, traditional houses. And at the other end of the spectrum, we also offer apartments and um, sometimes high rises and sometimes lofts. And what's often missing is the middle stuff, the duplexes, triplexes, townhouses, urban lofts. Your city is doing better than a lot of other cities in terms of introducing new missing middle housing formats. So, you know, the fact that you're building lofts in your downtown is helping fill some of those gaps. But I go to a lot of cities in Michigan, smaller to mid-sized cities that don't have that at all, and it truly is missing. So when they're looking for something else, what I mean is they're not necessarily wanting a house and they don't want an apartment either. They want really what they want is either a townhouse, not necessarily to buy, maybe to rent, or an urban loft or a loft over retail, or um, also it, you know, some of them may be looking for accessory dwellings even in a market where they feel like they're priced out, but they feel that maybe they could afford to rent an accessory dwelling. Um, so the, those types of formats, and I've actually, you know, we can get into, we can get in, into quite a discussion about different formats, but, you know, townhouses, row houses, they may be brownstones, you know, some of those formats, I think um, you don't really have as, as much as I might have expected to see. I think you're doing good on the urban lofts, but I'm, I'm gonna be curious to see whether there's a market potential for more brownstone type townhouses. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, let me say that uh, this is fascinating stuff. I, I have a little bit of familiarity with the clusters, and uh, but I did want to mention before we get st started that, that I'm looking forward to, to really digging into your analysis. Uh, myself, Dana Watson, and Annette Irwin are uh, closely associated with the local organization that builds affordable housing. So um, this study will have some real meaning for us. Uh, so. Um, and, and I have some thoughts that sort of are parallel to some of your data and I'd like to, I'm gonna look at your data to see if um, I'm correct or wrong or what have you. But I do have two um, technical questions since um, I am a data guy, it's, I spent my uh, career doing stuff similar to what you're doing, not in the area of housing per se, but um, two things. Uh, one, whose clusters are you using? Because there are a number of different uh, sets of clusters floating around ever since the original nine were created at Stanford some <laughs> 30 years ago or so. So may I ask whose clusters are they? Yes, that is a good question. You're right. There's prisms, mosaics, tapestries, um, different terms like that offered by different vendors. So I don't create the clusters myself for those of you who are new to it. I don't create the clusters or name them. I, I mm -hmm. do purchase and subscribe to the data. And um, the, the, the data that I use is the mosaics and the mosaics are provided by Experian. Experian, Prism, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, um, the credit agency? That's correct. Okay. Um, and the other one, the other question, and, and 
I don't want to take up the committee's time with a lot of this technical stuff, but how are you uh, measuring migration into small, in and out of small areas? So it's measured two ways. One is by looking at I, at the internal revenue surveys. Um, the, the internal revenue service, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm stumbling a little here. The IRS basically collects all the tax forms that it gathers, mm -hmm. you know, all the taxes that are filed. And when you file a tax form, you report whether your address has changed. And they actually collapse that data and report it back out on the internet. You can actually find data that that is reported by the IRS on migration by county and by city. I okay. also, it, plus mm -hmm. there's also the American Community Survey also reports data on how long residents have been living in their home. So we, I can look at East Lansing and I know what percent of your, of your population has been living in their current residence for less than a year. I know what percent have been living in their current residence for two years or mm -hmm. five years or 10 years. So I can back into it that way as well. Okay. Well, thanks. I, th I appreciate knowing that. Yep. Um, hey, Sharon. Um, this is Casey. Um, question for you about um, how, how we, how you control for or, or um, deal with the, the student population that we have. I mean, so are you still getting um, accurate data from say Experian um, when students, for instance, may not change their permanent addresses, they may claim and file taxes and keep their driver's license um, at their permanent residence, which could be you know, halfway across the state. Um, you know, how do you control for that variability? Is that, is that an issue and what do you do to uh, address it? Yep, so it's it's definitely not not perfect and no data set is is ever perfect. We we do the best with the data that we can that we get. Um, I do try to make an adjustment for um, student enrollment. So we are having a conversation. We have a scheduled conversation with the university staff, and Annette has hooked us up with the right people to talk to, and we're scheduled to have a discussion with them in a couple of weeks. Meanwhile, they, have, they already have a list of resources that we've asked them for that they're already working on this month on working to get us data. One of those important pieces of data is a history of student enrollment over time since um, hopefully we're gonna get it for the past 10 years, I, fingers crossed. And then also I've asked them for a history of student enrollment that's on campus versus off campus. So I'm going to try to match that up with my data. And if it doesn't match, I'll make the adjustment. I'll do the best I can. The thing about the colleges and cafes lifestyle cluster is that it doesn't include just students. It includes faculty and staff that have an, an affiliation with the university. So it's not as simple as just taking the colleges and cafes category or lifestyle cluster and just matching that up with students, it's not a perfect match. Um, but it's going to tell us, it's going to give us a good, um, it's still going to tell, uh, you know, an important part of the story. So Thanks. I hope that helps. That, it does. Thank you. Does anybody else have questions or concerns for Sharon? Dana, I, I think a... uh, this is Jennifer. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dana. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned the public schools. So that means you'll be able to tie it back to whether or not we are providing housing for families in the city of East Lansing. Yes. Yeah, so I, I don't do a study of the public school system, but the objective of the study is to determine the market potential for new housing. And we're gonna, we're gonna study the market potential by tenure for so both owners and renters, we'll split it that way. And then also by target market. So each of those 71 target markets, I'll come, I'm gonna do the math and figure out what percent of each of those lifestyle clusters moves every year. 
what percent are renters versus owners. And I can do that math. And then we're also gonna figure out based on their income, what their price tolerance is. So for the owners, we're gonna come back and show you the spectrum of prices that they're willing to tolerate. And then for the renters, what they're inclined to, to tolerate in terms of rents. Real estate analysis to study what you currently have in terms of housing stock. And <clears throat> I'm gonna, really be focused on the prices on that as well as you know just what is the quality of that housing stock what are the amenities that different attached buildings in particular are offering but i'm going to be able to come back and show you the relationship between price and unit size so this is a also a very important concept that um, it's an important part of the real estate analysis is that realizing that um, small units, small apartments or small lots usually get higher rents per square foot than larger units. The smaller the unit, the higher the rent per square foot. And th this mad, there's magic in that because we find that a lot of developers that are building projects across the state of Michigan believe they, they go into it believing that they need to build large units in order to get high rents in order to cover their cost. So right now the cost of materials, cost of labor is going up and it's, it's really a challenge for developers. And they, they think that they need to offset it by supersizing the units and then supersizing the rents. And we're trying to work with them to show that Migrating households can't afford those rents. And we have to right size the units in order to hit the rents that the migrating households can actually tolerate. And it becomes kind of an affordable housing study, but that's not, you know, it's not technically an affordable housing study, but it's it's an important part of the story. Okay. And I think you answered one of my other questions, which was who can afford to rent and um, who can afford to buy in the city of East Lansing. It sounds like income wise that you'll talk about that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And my yep. other final question is just other demographics. Are you gonna talk about um, other demographics like race and things like that in your study? Yep, we do not, we, know, we get into, um, I really stay focused on tenure and income and um, inclination to choose different building sizes and different building formats. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I've done some studies where we get into language spoken at home mm -hmm. or you know, share a population that may have migrated from overseas for some markets, but we don't typically get into race or ethnicity or people of color. Um, that's really, you know, it's, it's you know, we just, um, we tend to stay focused on income. And we know, of course, that it's correlated. Um, there are correlations in the data, but that's not the focus of the study. Thank you. Oh, Cyrene, um, I have a question sort of on those lines. Like we have people that come from Lansing, you know, Lansing, East Lansing, and then move in and out of other areas too. So we got people going to Okemos, got people going to DeWitt, people coming, back from DeWitt, back in East Lansing. Do you cover any of that? Well, we focus predominantly on who's migrating into the city. And it's, it's a fundamental piece of um, the analysis and saying, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try a different approach here. I go into some markets where um, they ask me to adjust the, the inflow of in-migration for the outflow of out-migration. And in a lot of markets, like Flint, for example, we might have a negative number. We might have 100 households moving in and 200 households moving out. And if I make that adjustment, I'm, I'm left with a negative number to try to study. So we really keep the study focused on in-migration there's kind of this philosophy that if, if they have migrated out, then we have lost them, they're gone. And we really wanna focus on who's actually migrating into the city, what are they looking for? 
and really, you know, just keep sharply focused on that. Okay. Um, this is Casey. I'd like to piggyback on Dana's question earlier, and I, I'm sorry if you answered this, but um, on demographics, will will we do you do any um, you know cross tabulation based on ethnic background, race at all, or will we I, only have the mosaics? lifestyle clusters? Yeah, I do not. Um, I don't really go into race or ethnicity usually. Um, I can, you know, in some markets, again, I like Hamtramck. When I did the Hamtramck study, we spent quite a bit of time looking at, you know, how many households are coming from Yemen or Bangladesh or Eastern European countries. Um, I don't, and you know, we, I could try to do some of that for you to just say, you know, where are they coming from? But I, I, it's not within the scope of this project to look at race or ethnicity. Um, it just isn't. I will say some of the lifestyle clusters do have, are heavily influenced by um, race and ethnicity, but it's not, you know, it's not transparent. I know from working with those lifestyle clusters, which ones are mo most inclined to be um, minority populations or people of color. So balance and harmony, for example, um, they're one of the groups. I don't have the list in front of me, but there's a couple of them that if they show up in the city of East Lansing or in Hamtramck or Dearborn, I know, I understand, you know, that, that they're, um, let's say, when they're described in the lifestyle clusters, they show up because they're, they have very traditional family values. They're very family oriented. Um, they're very aspirational, very hardworking, and, um, and they have high movership rates. So they show up that way. And I, you know, so again, yeah, the, my, my assignment is not to study race or ethnicity. Well, and I, I certainly um, don't, I don't think we have the authorization to expand your contract. So um, yeah. fair enough. The challenge is, yep, the challenge is work within a certain budget and, and address very specific questions. And if I try to do it all, I will, I, I wear, I, I, you know, I could wear myself out. <laughs> so Sharon, I have a question. This is Jennifer. Um, I think an issue that East Lansing does have is attracting uh, people who aren't students in downtown, uh, specifically like seniors and young families who, you know, would like to live directly downtown. Uh, can you address how your study can address this issue? Yes, absolutely. So this is something that I'm very focused on in the study. And the way that I do this is I, I'm going to study the lifestyle clusters that are migrating into the region, into the tri-county area. And then I'm going to compare that to who's moving into the city of East Lansing. And I'm going to be able to identify whether there are lifestyle clusters that perhaps are bypassing you altogether. And if they're bypassing you, it's probably because they're, they just can't find what they're looking for. So there's always- Which they can't. Right, so if I know that the striving singles are migrating into the tri-county area and you're only getting, you know, maybe, maybe let's say hypothetically, 5% of the striving singles, 5% of the mi households migrating into the region are striving singles and you're only getting 1%, then that tells me that we could do a better job. Uh, what about young families and singles? You haven't addressed that. I will look at all 71 lifestyle clusters and it's going to encompass all, you know, with 71 lifestyle clusters, it will cover everything from the singles to the um, aging of Aquarius, the affluent to the poor, the urbanites to the suburbanites and the full, those who want houses, those who want something else. It will, by, by, because my model will be run for each and every one of those 71 lifestyle clusters. It will encompass all those, um, those attributes. 
And when will your study be complete? Um, <laughs> that is a good question. I, I am, I laugh because I'm buried in I'm buried in the data right now. And I always, there's a certain point where I just need to like come up out of the data and say, okay, where am I at? And I'm, I'm knee deep in the data right now. I think that we had contracted like five or six months and I feel like I'm on track. Um, I'm, I'm probably two months into it. And so I feel like I'm on track. I don't feel like I'm falling behind, but um, we're probably looking at November, December, January, probably February, I would guess. Thank you. So, but I, you know, if I get, if I get bogged down in the data or, or stuck or a, um, there might be a time that I have to call Annette and ask for <laughs> forgiveness if I'm a little late. And I, I'm saying this because I would rather under promise and over deliver. And I don't want to tell you, hey, you'll have it by Christmas and then have me miss that deadline. I know it won't be, I'm, it probably won't be Christmas. Uh, Sharon, if I may, just a, just a quick editorial comment. Uh, do, do you expect to include a glossary of terms? Because your, 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 your discussion of lifestyle choices are quite colorful and, and, uh, and it, it definitely piqued my curiosity. But I'm wondering, if, could you perhaps have an appendix with the definition of terms? Just what exactly is an aspirational single and th those, those kinds of questions? Yes, so I, I address a lot of that in the narrative report. Okay. And I also will include materials that, that kind of give a glimpse into each of those 71 lifestyle clusters. So Thank I have you. like a, I have a two page summary with a one sentence description on each one. Aha, good, 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 know, good. That, that kind of thing is in okay. the report. Sharon, I was wondering, can you give us updates at like the halfway point and then maybe like a month out, a month before it's due, just to let us know, you know, if the time frame's changing or if you're on track um, for completion. Absolutely. One thing I don't do is I'm not. <clears throat> hang on a sec. <coughs> Sorry, I got a frog in my throat. I'm gonna take a drink of water. So one thing that I've um, told Annette and Tom that I will do is right around the 60 or 70% point when I feel like the data is really coming together and I'm ready to have a conversation with them about the data, then I'm going to ask for a phone conference um, with Annette and Tom and myself, and we'll go through that material. And then at that point, I'll... I'll listen to their questions. I might go back and make some refinements or try to address a few things. And then I'll give her another update. And hopefully when I give her that second update at that point, she, they can decide whether they feel comfortable with the information and if they wanna share it with you. So Annette and Tom, they're the gatekeeper on, that, on those resources and they'll be able to see the study coming together as I'm, as I'm working on it. And I usually, usually start around the 60% point. There will be a time when we will ask, once you start receiving materials, that um, the hardest part is, is just reading the narrative and really sitting down and digesting mm -hmm. the information and really studying the data. And it can be a bit cerebral. Um, I know you guys are up to the task because I can tell from your questions that you have no problem diving into the data and you're going to come back with good questions. I know you'll, I know you'll read the report. Um, so I'm, um, you know, I'm looking forward to those conversations. And as you have questions regarding the materials, we just ask that you funnel your questions back through Annette. So Annette will filter your questions. She may get the same question from three of you and then she can kind of distill it into one set of questions for me to, to, you know, that I could go back and try to address. There will come a time when I'll come back to you and present the results and we'll have a dialogue and I'll ask for at least an hour, maybe an hour and a half of your time where I will, I will ask that 
um, you know, that I will actually walk you through the document and explain to you how to read the material and, and what the implications could be for housing in the city of East Lansing, plus time for, for discussion. So we could think of that as a special meeting or a study group meeting, a study group session or a work session. Um, but I think that's important. Typically, prior to COVID, I would come in and do this in person. So if I can do it in person, I will. I think it's, I will come to you with handouts and um, we'll, we'll go through a handout together so that you'll, you'll be able to see the information and not have to digest it in a silo, but actually be able to have someone walk you through it and then have a conversation with the group. Uh, this is Larry. I have I have one last question and I just want a little clarification. So when you um, do your analysis, uh, you're looking at the overall uh, occup uh, population of the city of East Lansing and, and the lifestyles they fit into, um, you're not taking into account um, different areas within the city. You're, you're looking at it as a whole agglomeration. So it doesn't really matter where um, they actually live by neighborhood or, or any other smaller geography. Is that, is that right? So it's, it's all um, what sort of housing are available to what sorts of groups and what's missing. Is that a, a good summary? Well, you've summarized it well, but I actually am taking the city and I have split it into five sub areas. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Yes. And I took some liberty to just kind of define the sub areas on my own. Um, I included the downtown DDA area as one sub area. And then I have Northwest, Northeast, Southwest. Actually, I think I have, oh, and then the Northern tier. So yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Here. Yeah. Yep. And I tried and, to follow- I have one more question. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I generally followed the neighborhood boundaries. Go ahead, Dana. Sorry. Uh, no, this is Jennifer. I have one yep. other question with the census. Um, so are you going to incorporate the results or is it, or will your report miss all that information? Yeah, unfortunately, we won't see the results of the census until 2022 at the earliest. Right. My work my work will be done next year. So, yeah. But I'm a pretty good forecaster, so I will I will be forecasting data right um, usually I assume that at the best you would break ground on new projects in 2021, which would be a first full year of 2022. And then I try to provide forecasts out for at least out to 2025. And once I run the data, I, I typically advise that the data is good for about five years, unless something really weird happens like COVID-19. <laughs> <laughs> so COVID-19 is really, you know, changing the story on housing right now. And we can talk about that if you like, but um, yep. I'll, I'm going to be running the baseline data for 2022 with forecasts for 2025. Mm -hmm. I hear the well, census is a mess anyway. <laughs> Any other questions for Sharon before we uh, let her go tonight? Hey, I'm here. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. I'm yours. Thank you. All Sharon. right. Oh, just, God, Dana. Thank you. It's been helpful. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very much for your time. Thank I'm you. going to leave the meeting so you can have a conversation and continue with your agenda. And thank you again for the opportunity to talk with you. I hope you have a great night. Thank you, Sharon. Good thank evening. you, Sharon. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're about ready to go to item six, but I just want to give you guys a, a flag that um, somebody mentioned before our meeting actually started in passing that um, with Ed now gone, we are down a, a vice chair. Um, so I'm thinking of maybe adding an agenda item after our public hearing to um, see if we can rustle up a, a new 
uh, vice chair. So as we're uh, going through that um, public hearing, if you'd be so kind to think about whether you'd be interested in serving as a vice chair, uh, that would be great. Anything to say about that, Annette, other than what I did? No, thank you very much. Actually, I was going to, I meant to talk to you about that. And I was also going to check with the city attorney as far as protocol or anything, but I think we probably have it, can handle it. So, okay. Right, thank you. Okay. All right. Um, let's go to item six then an initial rest, rental license hearing for 523 Bainbridge unit 30. We have an application for a class three rental license allowing up to two unrelated people or a family. Uh, Annette, would you give us a staff report, please? Yes, I will. Um, it was an online packet. Um, all of this information was included. This is an application where the applicant has applied for a class three rental license. Um, so persons or a family. Someone, someone might want to mute. Yeah. Hey, Jason. I think you, uh, you've got some back channel chatter. I think I'm mute. Thanks. I, I just muted him. Jason will. Will. <laughs> Is that better? I apologize. I had my earbuds in. Okay. <laughs> you guys got me. Uh, yep. Yes. We have you. Yep. I'm gonna mute you though, so that we don't hear your background TV and whatnot. Can you guys hear me? Yes. You got me now? I apologize. Jason, yep. we're gonna mute you for a minute. Oh, okay. No problem. Thank you. Um, yeah. So the um, application uh, is class three rental license to unrelated or a family. Uh, this is a two bedroom, two bath condominium unit. Uh, with parking for two vehicles. This particular uh, condominium unit is located in the Hickory Hills condominiums. Uh, they did, uh, the applicant did provide the um, items we need to meet policy resolution 2002-8 and those were attached in the packet and all uh, provided online. Um, in addition, we do have the letter from the condo association uh, that they have um, reviewed and accepted uh, that the owner is applying for an application for a rental license. And we have a copy of the proposed lease <clears throat> in the bylaws that are intended to meet the criteria of our resolution. So the owner who you will be able to have an opportunity clearly to talk with is Jason Bannis of Pickney, Michigan. Um, Jason purchased this particular unit in January of 2013. It is in a RM08 zoning district. And so there's no rental restriction overlay to be concerned about in this area. Um, the property is inspected, re-inspected and is currently code compliant with those inspections and uh, report also was attached in the packet of that. Um, Mr. Bannis, um, we do believe may have previously rented this unit for a period of time. Um, and we did wanna bring that up I know that that was a concern of um, some of the other condominium owners. And um, I did explain that, you know, having done that in the past would not negate his ability to apply for a rental license. He has the right to apply and therefore become compliant. Um, we are not aware of any current renting that's happening there at all. Um, Mr. Uh, Bannis was notified uh, that he would need a rental license in order to rent and um, and therefore he I believe that's what brought him here now to to be in this process. Um, I don't know if there's other items to oh I did want to bring up and it is in the packet and online um, the correspondence from a couple of residents. Uh, here I have it handy. Um, we did get correspondence from two other residents uh, in the area, um, one of them in an apartment building next door and um, uh, raised that he was opposed to the granting of a rental license. Um, I can read it quickly so everyone has all this in case you didn't see it in the packet. Um, there's, he writes, there is no shortage of rental units in this part of East Lansing. 
Hickory Hills Condos is right next to Hidden Tree Apartments, which is which generally has available rental units. Granting a rental license for 523 Bainbridge number 30 would set an undesirable precedent, precedent that would lead to an additional rental applications and would gradually erode the quiet, stable, owner-occupied character of Hickory Hills community. I am an, a retiree and I've lived in my unit for nearly 10 years. I had one negative experience with students residing in a unit down the hall. I had to call the police on several occasions. I hope to avoid similar problems. I will note that's not referring to this particular unit, just to clarify. That is, a, as he said, a prior experience in, in a neighboring um, building. The other um, uh, email we received uh, also said, um, is from a neighboring condominium building and said, this is in reference to the housing commission meeting to be held remotely, the public hearing regarding the rental license for 523 Bainbridge, we would prefer that the council deny the, rent, the license application. Um, and there was no further um, reasons other than that would be what they prefer. So those were the two written um, correspondences that we received regarding this public hearing. We received no other, um, phone calls and um, I do not see that we have other people um, waiting to um, give public comment this evening. When I look at our list, there is, um, all I have is, is Jason. So uh, if anyone has questions of me, I'm happy to answer those. Any questions for Annette? All right. Um, well, if we don't have any questions from Annette, um, typically we uh, will have the person applying for the rental license um, address us if they'd like. They don't, Jason, you don't have to. Um, but if you'd like to, to say, introduce yourself and um, be available for uh, questions from the other commissioners, that would be. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, uh, no, no problem with that. Um, with the two emails, um, my condominium complex only gives out 15 rental units for the, I think it's 93 un total units in my place. Um, I'm sorry to hear that there is a older gentleman that is disappointed in that. Um, I try not to, when I lived there, I tried to help out people all the time. So um, if there's anything you guys need from me, any questions, feel free and just, Trying to be in compliant with everything. All right, does anybody have questions for you, Jason? This is Jennifer. Do you have someone in mind that um, that's interested in your unit? And I do understand the concern um, from the two people who uh, do not, uh, you know, go along with this. They think probably that you know, if you sell it, it could if you decide to sell it, you know, it would probably sell. And it sounds like too, you know, they've had maybe a couple of neg negative experiences in the past. So, th you know, they're just probably overly cautious, you know, they just want to feel safe and comfortable in their house. I, I, I understand. Um, I am actually not in one of the townhomes. I am in one of the uh, two units that are technically very similar to apartments. Um, again, we are supposed to have legally 15 units total as rentals in our 93. Um, I don't know these people. I know we are having our board meeting on the 20th of this month. Um, if they would like to address me in any way or the, or the council that we have very similar to what you guys have here. Um, this could have been brought up at any one of our meetings that we had had. This is the first I have heard of anything and I do appreciate all of my neighbors and I would not want to make anybody feel uncomfortable. Um, my place, in my opinion, is, is relatively nice. I've lived in East Lansing since 1997. I did live in a lot of apartments that um, were not the nicest of places. I am not looking to rent to a, you know, 19, 20 year old. Uh, I'm trying to keep my place. When I bought it, I redid I mean, the entire thing. I'm trying to keep it up to, you know, 
the standard of what it is right now. Um, I'm not looking to rent to, you know, basically students. And, and I, I was listening to what she was saying prior for how they're trying to get a certain demographic back into the city of East Lansing. Obviously with COVID going on right now, the housing market is skyrocketing. Um, there are a lot of people that are looking to rent and I don't think it would be an issue having it for rent. My place has been vacant for two years. Um, you know, I did have an ex-girlfriend that did claim on her taxes. She was paying rent. She never did. Uh, that was a slight issue. I had to go to the uh, council to, for tax information to get them. It was in Lansing. Um, it was kind of a nightmare for two years. Um, the place has been vacant for two years. So if they're having any issues in my unit, it's not coming from me. So I just want to say thank you for that. I just want to say that I don't want you to be discriminatory because oh. if a 19 or 20 year old can afford it, of course, you know, that oh. is their prerogative. So I don't want to come across as, you know, I don't think that, you know, uh, because you're a certain age, you know, uh, you should discriminate against them. I just oh, think I, it's about using your judgment and character. So I yes, just, you know, I, I just want to clarify that. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I'm sorry if it came off what I was saying came off that way. I was not, that's not what I was implying. All right. Does anybody, any other commissioner uh, questions for Jason? It's nice to put a face with, with Annette's name. I've been emailing her for quite some time. So it's kind of, I heard the voice a lot. It's nice to see a face finally. Yeah, thank you. All right, I've waited the awkward 10 seconds or so uh, to have somebody else chime in and I haven't heard anybody chime in. Okay, so I'm gonna say that uh, it sounds like we're finished with any questions. Um, any discussion among uh, commissioners uh, about this rental license before we uh, consider a motion? All right, I've waited the, uh, the 10 seconds or so. I haven't heard anything. So um, do I hear a motion on uh, the consideration of the rental license for 523 Bainbridge, Unit 30. Hi, this is Larry. I uh, move that we uh, approve the license of uh, 53, uh, whatever it is. Um, 523 Bainbridge, Unit 30. All right, I have a motion from Larry uh, to recommend the approval of the initial rental license for 523 Bainbridge, Unit 30. Do I hear a second? Yes, this is Irene. I'll second that. All right, a second from Irene. Should we do a roll call vote for this one, Annette? Um, uh, yeah, why don't we? Sure, yes. Uh, All right. Annette, would you be so kind as to call the roll then? Yes, absolutely, thank you. Casey? Aye, yes. Jim? Aye. Larry? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Irene. Aye. Jennifer. Aye. Thank you. The roll has been called all, uh, all present, uh, aye. All right, great. So that motion passes. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and Jason, feel free to stick with us or, uh, or not. <laughs> but we've, we've uh, gotten through your agenda item, so. Thank you very much. Cannot thank you enough. All right. Okay, Jason, um, we'll email you tomorrow. You will be, okay. This will be on a city council agenda in the future. However, you okay. do not need to attend that meeting by any requirement, but we'll keep you posted on when that would be just so that you have all the information, okay? Okay, perfect. Thank you so very much. Yes, have a good evening. You too. You guys stay safe. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, um, as I alluded to in between items number five and six, um, seems prudent for us to consider a, um, a new vice chair since Ed uh, departed to join planning commission, I believe it was, right? right. Um, 
So um, I think the traditional way we've done this, Annette, and please correct me if I'm wrong because I'm just going by memory, um, the way we've done the nominations in the past, I think we just opened the floor for nominations and then um, we considered the first one. And if the first person nominated gets sufficient votes to be the, to serve in that office, then they get it, right? That, yes, that would be correct. Okay. All right. So I would say, um, and I, just as a reminder, I mean, I think at the end of that, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the gist of the gig, so to speak, of the office is um, to fill in and to, to run the meeting um, if the chairperson isn't uh, present. Um, beyond that, I don't think there's a whole lot to do, but Annette, correct me if there's, there's more that is uh, involved. No, you have it. It would, uh, the vice chair's commitment would be um, beyond being on the commission would be to lead the meeting if the chair is not present. Um, you know, you also sometimes get invited to a, um, but the era we're currently in, we're not doing these things so much, but um, once a year, it seems that there, as I recall, we have a gathering typically with chairs and vice chairs invited um, from all across all the boards and commissions to do a presentation. Um, mm -hmm. That's something you might not want to have to be nervous about if it's something that bothers you, because I think we're those are the kinds of things that right now we're, um, you know, probably not doing. Um, but yeah, that would be your your commitment. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I would say that the floor is open. Um, do I hear a nomination for vice chair? Can we nominate ourselves? I'm all right with that. Are you all right with that, Annette? Yes. Oh, this is Irene. I'm nominating myself. I don't <laughs> mind <the> competition. <laughs> I second the motion. I second the motion. Jennifer, so we've got a, a motion and a second. All right. Uh, then what we'll do is is we'll we'll take a vote uh, on that nomination. If if Irene does not get a, a sufficient vote, uh, sufficient majority vote to be selected, then we'll take, uh, we'll open the floor back up and see uh, who else is um, uh, willing to do that. So uh, all those in favor of Irene as uh, the vice chair, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. All right, motion carries. Congratulations, Irene. You are the vice chair of the housing commission. Well, thank you. I have a question. This is Jennifer. Congratulations, Irene. But Annette, um, when does their term end? I forgot. Oh, it's just a year, right? Yes. No. Yep. Yep. It'll be um, the end of December. In January, um, we every board and commission um, takes nominations for uh, chairs and vice chairs again. Of course, you can reserve as chair and vice chair, but we will do this again in January. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thanks folks. Um, for, we snuck in that, I guess we'll call it 6.5 item on our agenda. Um, now I think we're ready for any old business. Is there any old business? I don't believe there is, but I'll do this 10 second pause just in case. Okay, it was a fast 10 seconds, but I'll count it. Uh, new business, uh, number eight. Anybody have some new business for us to consider? No, nothing relating to housing commissions, Irene, um, but the survey that Annette sent out from MSU about COVID-19, I finally mm -hmm. did it tonight. It was really a good survey, I thought. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, we could just you know, um, send it around the community and ask them what they think. Yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, I'm planning to um, send it to our like neighborhood association. Um, oh, good. So I don't know if anybody else is involved with their neighborhood associations, but that might be a good way to get mm. the word out. Yes. Okay. Good idea. All right. I'll say that's good. We're good to go on old business and new business. Uh, so do we have staff report, Annette? 
Sure, I'm going to um, first defer uh, because we do have Dana here with us this evening as our new council liaison. Dana, although I know you were appointed, what, a month ago or I don't know, the time is all crazy right now. <laughs> but, um, and I'm happy, I think, um, unfortunately we had a few technical glitches, but maybe fortunately all of you had an opportunity to chat for a minute um, and meet Dana for those of you who hadn't. But if I um, may, I'm going to let Dana, if she has anything that she wants to stay to say to the commission or um, questions you have of Dana, um, I would say let's do that first. And then I have just a few minor things that I'll uh, update you all on. I just want to say I'm happy to be here. I was formerly on planning commission and um, housing affordability diversification is something that's really important to me in the city of East Lansing. So I was excited that I could be the liaison um, for the housing commission. And um, yeah, my name is Dana, I'm in Bailey um, neighborhood. I have three kids. I have a high schooler, a middle schooler and a fourth grader. And um, we were talking before, you know, I like to do walk jogs um, in the mornings or just kind of like whenever to just kind of stay in shape. And uh, despite our lack of sun, I did appreciate, you know, the changing leaves and stuff and saw just beauty in that, especially when you get out in the fresh air. But anyway, any questions or comments? Welcome. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Welcome. Welcome. You said you're in the Bailey neighborhood, is that right? Yes. What street are you on, please, Dana? I am right on Hagedorn. Hagedorn. Okay, good. Good, good. I'm, I'm in Butterfield. Okay. Right. So Bailey as well, then? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. cool. Yes. And Irene, I'm on 657 Virginia Avenue, and we have our Bailey um, Community Association meeting next week. On yeah. our right. Virtual. Yep. I plan to be at that one. And also, you know, I've just been kind of throwing out that we've got two open seats to folks. So if you all in your networks or expanded networks, can you guys hear my kids? <laughs> We're all in the same boat there. <laughs> but um, just, you know, we've got two open seats, right? If we yes. you know, just spread the word, I've been spreading the word and okay. yeah. you do. Thank you, Dana, both for joining us tonight and uh, agreeing to serve us as a, as a whole city on council. I appreciate it. Yes, here, yeah. here. Yes. All um, right. Um, oh, I guess I'm sorry, Annette, you've got more on staff reports, right? Just, just briefly. So um, I think a uh, couple of things. One, that yep, I did forward the survey. I will continue, and it seems to be working out for you all. I will continue as things come along. Um, to just keep you all informed forward, you know, uh, things that are happening in the city forward and what I think are important. I know y'all can see press releases or what's in the news or on our social media, but I know and if it's something that I think is really pertinent to this particular group um, or that you would enjoy, or that maybe it would be good for you to share with your neighbors or they come to you because they know you're on the housing commission. I'll be sure to try and um, to continue to forward all of that on to all of you. Um, and so uh, I also need to, I will get more with Dana and give you more information. We do have a packet. I usually give new commissioners a notebook, essentially. Um, some of it is information you already have as a council member, but other information would be helpful, I know. Um, so I just, I definitely will do that. And maybe perhaps you and I can connect up too, and you can ask me some, any other questions you might have about the commission and the work we've done in the past or, or see moving yeah. forward. So, um, and then uh, the only other thing, um, you know, I know there's a lot going on in the city with clearly with COVID um, beyond what we do as a, as an organization. Um, there has been social media and I think a press release I, I didn't forward on um, but it's good information to have and to share in regards to um, enforcement of some of the emergency, the health emergency orders. So um, there's 
the same things in place essentially through the health department. And that's the limiting of outdoor gatherings to no more than 25 persons, 10 inside, you know, that's probably not, that's hard, you know, who'll know who's inside your house in many cases, but 25 outside I think is one of the big concerns. Um, and so we wanna share that information broadly so that everyone knows and uh, now our, our police will be able to issue civil infraction citations for those, whereas before we did not. Um, so that's just something I think to share with folks so that they're aware. We don't want anyone to, I think, kind of be caught off guard that they could get a civil infraction for that. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. And there's information on our website. And if you have questions, you can ask me or, or of course, email me. The other thing is just a reminder, anything you have a question about, send me an email. You know, we don't have to wait till we have a meeting, of course. Um, and with the housing study, as Sharon said, as she gets a little farther down the road, if I can give you bits of updates and answer those questions, um, connect you in any way, if you have something um, pertinent, we'll, we'll certainly be following through with that. I think that's about all I have, unless you, anyone has a question for me. No. Um, oh, can I, can I make just a very brief announcement? Yeah. It's sort of related. Um, as today is the, uh, whoops, I'm on mute, I think. No, I'm, I'm okay. okay. <laughs> um, today is the 15th of October, and um, I guess the courts have finally uh, gone back to shortening the end of the census. I'm the chair of the uh, East Lansing Complete Count Committee, and some of you know I'm, I'm the former state demographer. Um, if anybody here or anybody you know has especially who lives in the city of East Lansing has not filled out a census. You still can do it online. And I think you can do it till approximately six in the morning, which is probably midnight in Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, okay. Um, it's not midnight Eastern time, but uh, if you can get to it tonight, it would be great. And I believe it's uh, the website is 2020 census.gov. So if you haven't done it yet, uh, you can still participate, and it's very important. The city of East Lansing receives close to $2,000 per person each year uh, for 10 years based upon census count, and that's money that, that comes for a variety of projects, including education, infrastructure, um, uh, poverty alleviation, any number of things. That, uh, and it's very, very important for the city of East Lansing. Plus, we're hoping that the population will exceed 50,000 in this current census. It has not in, in the past. And the reason for that is that there are certain federal programs which kick a city into a higher um, uh, uh, reimbursement pattern or, or funding pattern when you reach the $50,000 mark, a uh, 50,000 population mark. So that's very important to us. So uh, I urge anybody who hasn't participated, this is the time, got to do it. And it's, it's, it'll take you five minutes and all the information is confidential. Thank you. So that's it. Annette, just, um, I think we have a total of nine commissioners, right? We're supposed to, we can have up to nine. So we're missing three because of Ed. Because of Ed now, right? Yes, yes. thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we need to no rustle planning commission rent. until at least December. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, everybody. Anything more before we say goodbye? Good meeting. Glad, glad, I'm glad the system was working. Yes. yes. By the time we get we get it just right, we, we'll get together <laughs> we'll again. It. Yeah, yeah. Murphy's <laughs> law. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much. It was great to see your faces, uh, even if it's over a screen. And I hope you guys uh, enjoy the rest of this beautiful October in East Lansing. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Bye. Bye-bye. Hang out here last, so. <laughs> thanks, Annette. See ya. Maybe I'll see you running. Yeah, sounds good. I'll stop next time, I promise. <laughs> All right. Going to start? I'm going to end.